now. So you might get that pop-up that asks if you're okay with recording this, please go ahead and hit accept if that pops up. Um, and so Brady joins us as the legislative manager with the Division of Child Support. And Brady, thank you for being here. Um, there were a couple of items that I had sent to him to discuss, and um, I hope that he helps uh, everybody and everybody learn something from here. So Brady, thank you and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Kaylee, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, again, my name is Brady Hornstein. I'm an attorney in, at the Division of Child Support, and my primary area of focus is in our policy unit um, doing legislative legislative work, but also support the policy unit on a range of our internal policy work and also agency request legislation and other legislative issues. So um, as you know, we're in the middle of leg we're well, more than the middle. We're towards the end of legislative session and um, actually been a fairly light session for child support related issues. But as you know, the legislature has been quite active and it's always active in court related matters and um, dependency and some other things that we're going to talk about today. So thank you for the opportunity to join you. And I'm pretty, pretty easygoing, pretty casual. So feel free to unmute yourself and questions or um, you can always reach out to me at any time after after the meeting as well. I'm always happy to talk with anybody about um, child support issues or connect you to any resources that are uh, the Division of Child Support. Um, we have a bunch of materials I can always um, provide or connect you with a, a subject matter expert. Um, and we certainly want to be a resource um, to all of you. And obviously, a lot of you probably do work with the prosecutors handling child support in a lot of your counties, um, so they can be great resources as well. So feel free anytime to reach out to any of us and we'll be as helpful as, as possible. So today, um, we're going to talk about a few things that all of you suggested. Um, we're going to talk, just touch on the three parent worksheet. And as I think most of you know, the um, AOC released um, a child support schedule worksheet in January that actually has an extra column kind of accommodates um, in cases where there are three legal parents. So we'll talk about that and kind of take a, a look at the worksheet. Um, it's kind of certainly a new, I mean, we'll talk about the background and kind of what's happening. I actually haven't seen anything in the last couple of months, a specific case dealing with it. So I'm curious to hear from some of you if what you've been seeing out in the out in the wild as well. Um, we'll also talk about self-employment, which is another issue that um, was suggested, which is how do we calculate self-employment income, which certainly has a, a number of challenges, as I think all of you know, in dealing with that. Um, and then we'll also talk about dependency cases, although they're often not really, there's not usually a whole lot of child support issues. There's, this is a really active area of the law in the last couple of years um, some, with some new changes and things are continuing to, to change um, even this session and, and I think in the next, next several months. So we'll highlight those and, and talk about those. So the first thing I wanted to do though is just jump right into the three parent worksheet piece, which um, candidly, like I would, I mean, this is one of those where you no know, facilitators, you're, uh, you know, important, you know, important role working with these pro se individuals, but this is one where it's such a complicated area of the law. Whenever possible, I would encourage um, parents to try and at least get some legal aid or some sort of legal help on if they're approaching a, um, you know, a, a legal parentage case where they're trying to be um, adjudicated as a parent. Uh, I mean, it's just kind of a very complicated, I think it's a complicated area of family law. I know it was complicated when I was in private practice for attorneys. So um, it's just one of those, but it's a very interesting area of the law, I think historically and for family law practitioners. And so I'll just touch on some some background. So we're all on the same page. I think many of you know, the Washington Supreme Court was really um, trend setting, really went out, um, was on the forefront of this um, com commonly referred to as de facto parentage back in 2005 with the case um, parentage of LB. And that essentially kind of established a court kind of a framework for um, the court to actually recognize these quote unquote de facto parents um, who could be a, you know, a grandparent comp was pretty common that I private practice or a very close aunt or uncle, someone who's very involved in the, in the care of a child, right? So more than just kind of the quote unquote typical, um, see family members around holidays, see, you know, it 
you know, basketball games and kids soccer practice or soccer games and stuff like a real, essentially really a, a very active um, parent like uh, individual or a group or a couple um, in case of grandparents, for example. But back in 2018, the legislature actually adopted the Uniform Parentage Act, which is quite comprehensive in a number of areas of parentage, but some components of it included the um, statutory language around adjudicating the claim of the de facto parentage and the actual process that um, the court had recognized in Parentage of LB. It actually created a statutory process and kind of governs all the temporary orders and the procedures associated with actually adjudicating parentage and how someone can um, kind of assert a claim for parentage. So um, there are a number of statutes now that govern govern this, which I think is, is very helpful and provides to individuals, um, litigants, and um, practitioners, and all of you as well, and those of us in the child support. Um, so like I said, there are these three parent child support schedule worksheets that were available, made available this year, which we'll actually take a look at this, this sheet in a minute. Um, but interestingly, I'll note that DCS, so the Division of Child Support, while we're pretty heavily involved, obviously, in child support, and we do work to establish administrative child support obligations, we do not establish child support obligations in situations where there are more than um, two legal legal parents, unless there's a court order. So we are not administratively on our own um, addressing this. It's entirely, we need a court order before we establish a child support order um, for um, more than two parents. So I thought that's just an important reminder. So this is entirely a court process, at least at the front end. Once there's a court order that establishes parentage for additional parents and a court order around um, child support for three parents, then we're happy to, um, enforce that order and do that part of our work, but we're not doing this independently of the courts. Um, so um, I'll just highlight things I'll touch on, then we'll jump over to the worksheet. So like I mentioned, the court has to adjudicate legal parentage. There is a provision in the law for temporary orders, the issues pending, which is similar to other family law actions. Um, so the court could award a temporary order of support, for example, as the issue is being addressed before a final order. Um, and we'll, like I said, we'll touch on the worksheet. And it's essentially um, nothing to be afraid of. I think it's in, it just has one additional column for a third parent's income information. Um, and then the same process, except it's spread over three parents instead of two. So I'm gonna, um, let me jump over and actually, I'll switch over and share the actual um, worksheet, if you indulge me for a second. And so let me. I'm going to share this one window. Then you'll see I'm just on the worksheets for um, court page, and there's the child support schedule worksheet, um, three parent. And you'll see the date, and you can load this just like you load the other forms. So let me expand this. I think let me zoom in here a little so we can look at it. But you'll see, um, you know, it looks exact. I mean, other than the extra column and asking for the additional parent's name. Um, it's pretty much exactly the same as the two parent worksheet. So it does, there is no worksheet for if there are more than three parents, that's a, I think an even more rare situation. So those so people would have to develop that form on their own or add their own column in here for that. But, um, and I haven't actually seen that personally, but I'm sure it exists out there, but it's nice the AOC has this form. This is really helpful. So those of you who've helped people or reviewed these um, before, you can see it's all um, goes on this form. You just have it for three parents instead of two. Um, and, you know, all these, so the issues that come up with child support schedule, you know, with the worksheet, um, like healthcare costs and self-employment and um, income and all of those issues remain um, issues that have to be resolved and have to be addressed when you put, um, you know, when someone is putting this together. And so um, you just work your way down. Then it's, it starts to get into the computations where, um, you know, it asks, um, you know, to make the computations that you, you're used to seeing. It just asks you to make the proportional share of income. So it's simply asking you to do it for each parent, which gives you three slots instead of two. 
Um, and all of this information is exactly the same, like I said, on the other worksheet version of two, it just more information for the judge and the commissioners to use to determine um, their actual child support, child support awards. So um, like I said, I mean, I think there are a lot of issues with legal, not the worksheet itself, but just a lot of legal issues that can come up for legal parentage in general. So I definitely would, this is one of those where as much as you can encourage people to get some basic legal, legal advice is definitely recommended. I think even um, Northwest Justice Project and other of those groups, they even um, recommend that when dealing with legal parentage as well. So, um, and you're, you know, I encourage you to take a look at this. And I'd be curious if anybody has any, has seen this before this year yet, people bringing a three parent worksheet to you, or if you have any specific questions or issues that you you've experienced working with this, but um, from my perspective and, you know, kind of our perspective, like I said, you know, I'm not practicing anymore, but I do know it's, a, can be challenging, but also I think the form itself is relatively straightforward with this additional column. But like I said, I, I'm curious to hear from many of you if you've run into it, if there are some specific issues you'd like me to address or um, anybody has any, I'd love to hear them as well and how it's working. And if not, that's okay too. So I know the, um, AOC, the Pattern Forms Committee and the Domestic Relations Committee is very active. Um, and I think even DCS has a representative on that committee. So there are a lot of opportunities to um, address concerns and kind of raise issues and share information. So hopefully that um, that works out. And I'm curious, I don't, you know, obviously this is a growing area of the law. Like I said, more and more, we're going to see more and more people. There's been a lot of national coverage, even if you just Google you know, search for three parent families, there's been a lot of national coverage about states um, adopting the Uniform Parentage Act and doing similar, similar things. So it will certainly be a growing area of the family law. I think you'll see a lot more of this. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of a wait and see approach. But and Kaylee, I don't know if you had any thoughts or any or anybody, you saw anybody raise their hand or anything? I yeah, I don't see anything yet. Um, I wanted to ask you too, and I apologize, we didn't talk about this in advance, uh, but if people do have questions, do you want them to just chime in or do you- Oh yeah, them feel to free to just chime in. in. Yeah, feel free to chime in or you can okay. put it in the chat. Like I see Angela did ask, do you know if the child support calculator will be updated for us to utilize this? And that was a good question. I was thinking, I didn't get a chance to get an answer to that today, but I will um, find out for sure. But yeah, feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in throughout if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, this is Becky from Kitsap. Hi. So I want to make sure I understand the court order part of it. If we had the order that makes the finding that there is a de facto parent, will Division of Child Support do the calculations and take it over from that point? Or do we actually have to do the calculations? Um, yeah, the court, the court has to actually do the calculations. Court has to, is. is so you would only be the collection. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's pretty. I mean, in my experience also, I mean, correct me if anybody's seen anything different, but it's pretty com it's pretty uncommon for, I mean, it's pretty common that um, at least one of the parties, right, who's trying to get either de facto parentage or um, has legal representation and just pursuing it through, you know, they're pretty sophisticated in that they're pursuing it through the court process. Um, but um, obviously that that can depend. Then another question from, is this something can be done in a minor guardianship um, case? Like the parents have visitation, but grandma has custody and wants child support. So um, I can talk about, I'm going to talk about that, I think, in the dependency piece. I mean, there are some opportunities for, um, depending on the circumstances, um, for grandparents to request either public assistance or request child support. I think in a guardianship case, they may not be... Um, actually, you know, that's a little different than actually being a de facto parent or being an adjudicated a parent. So um, there are some 
some ways for them to get access to resources. So I can send you some more information on that, but I don't think it would be done through the this three-party um, legal parent process in most of those cases. So with that, um, like I said, I mean, I'll, um, like I said, there's not a whole lot of information developed yet since it's new, not a whole lot of guidance, you know, even that we provide internally to our our staff because it's so new and so rare that we actually come across, across this, but obviously that's going to continue to change as this area develops, more people become aware of it. Um, and so I'll certainly share additional information as I come across it. So um, all of you can be up to date on that. Will there be a separate child support order where there's a third column as well? And, and then are we going to have like a an additional parenting plan that would address like three potential parents? Yeah, that's a good question. I will... Um... I'm not aware of any, I'm not aware of the timeline for the development of any of that right now, but I will, um, I'll find out and um, I'll ask um, one of our staff here who's working on, who represents, who represents DCS on the um, domestic relations forms and see if there's um, some efforts on that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that I was thinking about that this morning as I was preparing for this too, that becomes an interesting issue because just having the worksheet then it runs into all sorts of other other issues with um, parenting plans and all sorts of things um, come about so it's a good question and I will chase it down so with that um, let me jump back over to the PowerPoint here and so, like I said, I'll um, chase, those are great questions. I'll chase down some additional resources or answers to those. And as I get some additional information, I'll certainly pass that along to Kaylee so uh, she can send that to all of you. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk, so that's kind of my high level overview of the three parent worksheets. I think, like I said, just know that it's there, um, works the same way. And there are a lot of kind of new unresolved issues as this area of law continues to, to develop and people start utilizing this part of the, the process. Um, next thing I wanted to jump into though is self-employment income. And this obviously I think is probably more common. I think you probably run into this, get a lot of questions about this. Um, and this candidly is a really to for us the Division of Child Support that for our support enforcement officers as well. Um, because it's very rare or it's um, it's not super common that you have someone who's just a self-employed individual with a very stable income, you know, very stable business. Usually um, it's very common to see people with very sporadic income amounts um, and even um, depending on what they do, what their, um, their self-employment work is, even just how they're paid can be um, sporadic without you know, even formal records and things. So there are a lot of issues that come about with how we um, determine self-employment income. But at, at, um, at a high level, I mean, it's a, we know it's a growing area of, um, it's a growing number of people nationally have um, report self-employment as their primary source of income. We know nationally it's about 10% of the workforce and, and COVID-19 has certainly changed that. I don't have any specific data, but um, I've read a lot about and we know that it is changing. Also, just the big economy um, and also younger workers, millennials and Gen Z seem to be um, at higher rates kind of rejecting the traditional um, nine to five um, work for work for a business in traditional sense. So it's going to be a, an increasing, you know, we're going to see more and more people bringing um, self-employment income as their income to to these child support cases. So, um, you know, kind of at a threshold, the the accurate income information is the key here. And that is where all the challenges come in, right? And that's because some of the areas I mentioned, is the income consistent or is it sporadic? And that could be just sporadic in terms of their, it's very project-based and they might have good weeks and um, bad weeks or good months and bad months, or it's seasonal. Um, and um, a lot of times, like I mentioned, the record keeping is um, 
questionable or just inadequate in a lot of cases. Um, sometimes, as you know, business people who have self-employment, it's a very structured business and they have, they're using QuickBooks or they're accounting and they have a really good um, system in place for their business. Other people, it's just a bank account. It's not maybe not even a business bank account. They're just kind of, as they do work, they get, get some cash and put it in the bank or spend it. Um, so there aren't a lot of records like for a regular employee, W-2 employee. Um, you also have issues with business expenses. So that's a big issue. Someone could make, you know, $100,000 in total revenue, but if their expenses are, you know, if they're a contractor and they're buying materials and spending half that on materials, which isn't, you know, which is very possible, um, you want to make sure that the expenses can be accounted for as well so that they're not, um, so that an order is not established based on gross income when that's actually not the actual net income that they, they receive. Um, there's also the issue of, um, you know, not to cast aspersions, but there's just an issue of hidden income as well. You know, when someone is a W-2 employee, so most of you, you know, are W-2 employees of the counties you work at, so you actually receive a regular paycheck and a W-2 uh, state of the year. So that information is all reported to um, employment security and the Division of Child Support actually has access to that. We have access to tax information, so we can verify a lot of that. But if someone pays you, you know, $500 to paint a shed or something and they pay in cash and you don't actually have an invoice, you're not recording it as a business owner, um, it's pretty difficult for um, the Division of Child Support to um, even know about it. Um, but there are definitely a lot of cases we know, we just know in general that um, a lot of contractor activity is under the table. So that's just, just a reality of the situation. Um, so the other piece to this that you may come across as you're working with people um, or reviewing materials or um, is that there are varying levels of complexity with regard to businesses, right? So um, you have a bunch of different business types and it really runs the gamut. You could have some people, uh, like I said, are more sophisticated and their business may be organized as an actual corporation. And if it's like an S corporation, which is a special IRS tax status, for example, they would have a salary from the company, which would actually be a W-2 reported salary. And then they would probably have other income that's distributed to them as profit. So if it's a sophisticated business like this, there are a lot of records because the tax requirement um, reporting requirements and such. So you'll probably see a lot of records in that case, but that's probably the most sophisticated for a self-employed individual. They might have that structure. Then you'll see a lot of what sometimes called single member LLCs or limited liability companies, which is something that people form similar to corporations through the secretary of state provides some liability protections. But a lot of time it's, times it's just one person working for this LLC. Um, and the record keeping, you know, can be can vary as well in there. It's not as um, necessarily as advanced as the S corp, but um, hopefully you see a little more advanced record keeping with a single member LLC. You might also have partnerships, which are common in um, um, law firms or sometimes organized as partnerships. Um, doctors' offices. I saw like a chiropractor practice. Practice had a few doctors organized, chiropractors organized as a partnership, um, so, or you might just have a couple people organized as a partnership. I think you see fewer and fewer partnerships um, kind of in the current, current structure. Most people are forming LLCs instead of partnerships, but it's possible. And then the other one is a sole proprietorship, which is literally just kind of someone, you know, operating a business as, as themselves. Um, registered with the state, though, they actually, you know, it might, might be Brady's, Brady's art, you know, art supplies. And it's just a, that's all it is. It's a business just registered and I'm the only, only owner. And then you run into the case, which I think is really common, which is someone who has a contract position or a contract job with, um, you know, maybe they do, I saw someone there do event planning and they're not actually a full-time employee. They just work odd hours. And so they don't even have their own business organized. They just receive, they're paid as they work and um, they receive at the end of the year, um, a 1099 form from the, from that company. And then you could also just have people doing, right, just working for themselves. They haven't registered 
at all and they're just doing odd jobs and it's all kind of that's where you get into that hidden money or just kind of under the table or not not very formal so these are kind of all the issues that you'll see when dealing with self-employment income um, and i'm sure it's very common we hear it as well as one you know the custodial parent or one of the former spouse says, I know he makes all this money, he's, but it's all under the table and there's no records, but I know he's making all this money because look at the all the stuff he buys and he has a new truck and a, you know, he has a boat and he's go, doing all this stuff and he's say he only makes $20,000 a year or something. So that's pretty common. You know, we hear that and you'll probably hear that and you do hear that as well. So that's, that's where we get into it's pretty tough um, and the record keeping is so important. Um, but there are enough sources where we can try and nail that down. So, um, so we base and, you know, kind of the law overarching law says, you know, we calculate the income based on the best available information. And there are a bunch of different ways to do that. So the easiest way and probably the cleanest way is looking at tax returns. So if you have someone who's following the rules um, and is reporting their business income, you should see it on their individual tax returns, on their 1040 returns. And it should actually show there's usually a Schedule C or some sort of actual attachment on the tax return for their business. And it shows their total income and it shows their expenses. So that makes it really easy. It gives you the number um, that you can um, refer to or that they can put pretty easily into the into the worksheet and it's very easy for a commissioner or a judge to look to verify it. They can pull, um, someone can provide a copy of those tax returns and they can look at the, associ the associated information in the tax return and confirm that information. If it's a little more complicated, like a corporation or a partnership, but like I said, they often have their own separate tax return. So um, commissioner or judge um, might ask for the actual corporation's returns which are filed separately in a lot of cases. So you can actually see what the business is making and what the business's expenses are um, if it's not clear on the tax, the individual tax return. Um, you can also, like I mentioned, those 1099 forms and anybody I think who makes over $600 from a, from a company should be getting these 1099 forms. So even if you work, you drive for Uber, or deliver food for DoorDash or um, do odd jobs for some, a business, um, there should be these 1099 forms that are provided on an annual basis to the um, to the individual. So um, they should be able to provide those as well if they have them. And then there are other, in addition to the returns for corporations or partnerships, car corporations and partnerships also produce what's called a, a K-1, which is a specific document that's given to the, to the business owners or the shareholders that actually has this income information as well and the expense information kind of shows for tax purposes what the amounts are um, and if you don't have these formal tax tax forms or tax returns which i think are kind of the best best evidence or the best available information because someone submitted their tax returns under penalty of perjury to the to the irs we know that it's a federal crime to commit tax fraud so we can kind of assume that people by and large are um, the best of their ability are complying and that that information is is accurate so having those tax returns is really helpful um and i should mention too there are state tax returns that are filed so businesses often file state returns so you could ask for those for business returns as well um or encourage people to look at those and then, um, if, like I said, if the tax returns aren't there, this specific tax information, then um, the next best thing I think is uh, what I think a lot of you know from accounting is just a profit and loss statement. So businesses should, I think every business is actually technically required under federal law to maintain their books and maintain um, a profit and loss statement. Um, it's definitely good practice in case they're audited or anything comes up, but it's a report that they can generate Usually if they're using QuickBooks or some sort of bookkeeping software, or if they have an accountant, it's a document that they're able to produce um, basically on demand at any time. And it lists all the revenue, all the, all the business income, and then all of the expenses that the, the business has incurred. And it can usually be generated for, um, for the last calendar year, for a particular month or a year to date. And so people should be able to get that information. If you don't have these pieces, then it just becomes, um, really difficult because you're really, um, people have to kind of piece it all together. They have to, they might have invoices from customers and receipts of expenses. And you can just, you know, I'm sure you've run into this where it's just, 
it's really a mess and it's not very clear um, for the, you know, what the income is and what the expenses are. They don't have good record keeping. They say they make a certain amount, but it's really hard to actually confirm any of that. Um, and so you can piece it together and they might piece it together by looking at, and the court might do that by looking at bank statements and um, other, other records. So that's where there's, it's probably likely if that's the case and you have that situation I talked about where, um, you know, one former spouse or a parent is saying, oh, I know they have all this money. Um, this is probably an area of dispute that would likely go to the go to the judge or the commissioner to actually work out and they'd have to come to some sort of determination because there's probably not going to be an agreement. But, you know, if not, I mean, someone could present and say, look, I have here are the 10 invoices or the 10 projects, 10 jobs I had and here are the expenses and demonstrate that, provide that information and attach that or include that information in the worksheet. And that that may be the best best that they have. If there isn't any information on income and the tax returns don't include it, then the court um, and even child division of child support, that's when we start to look at imputing income based on kind of the median income or um, for someone their age and gender or looking at um, just a number of other factors that, to try and come to some sort of some sort of amount. So hopefully though, you're most of the time you're dealing with a situation pro se is where they can provide some sort of explanation, have some sort of records for the court um, regarding their income. And that's, that's obviously ideal. Um, so in terms of completing the worksheet, right? I mean, the, um, you know, there's the section pretty straightforward um, for the gross monthly income. And that's where I think the question comes in if the parties agree on that. I mean, that's obviously helpful. Um, and so there isn't a dispute on that and that's where those records help. And then if you're dealing with um, income that is sporadic on an annual basis, for example, seasonal work, um, someone in a sales, sales job where there are commissions that come as they make sales, those sort of things. That's where I think it makes sense to take an average. So you try to come to some sort of average amount for on an annual basis. Um, and the worksheet, I think the instructions do provide a fair amount of guidance on ways to calculate income. So um, people can take a look at those. But that's, I think, kind of the, the typical approach. So if someone makes $75,000 a year and it's, you know, 30,000 of that could be a base salary and the others are commissions. And you can look over the last couple of years and see that's a pretty stable amount. And we know they tend to get sales and end of the year, it spikes up or middle of the year, depending on what they do, or if they, you know, they're landscaping and it gets busier, they have more projects in, um, you know, in the summer months, for example, but take, getting an average is probably the best way to do that. The other thing though, is to make sure, and this is just in general, um, for people who are self-employed is the monthly deductions is really important because um, otherwise, some, it could really get themselves in a situation of the family in a situation where um, they aren't able to make their child support payments. If they just, if you say as a business owner, if you put your um, monthly income in there and you don't put any of the deductions for taxes, um, materials or supplies, maybe your for your, um, you know, maintenance van or plumbing, you know, equipment or, you know, supplies for projects, um, then the child support is assessed based on, since it's assessed based on the net uh, income, if you don't have expenses in there, don't have a total picture of your expenses, then someone will get a higher child support order. And then when they actually, at the end of the month, when they're trying to make the payment, um, it will be higher than they, ha than they have an ability to, to pay. So that creates challenges down the line. So that's where I think it makes sense for, and some of this, like I said, it really depends on the individual and how sophisticated they are and how and how sophisticated their business is set up. Some are really good at this and have, you know, they've been in business a long time and they uh, have good records and they track expenses really well and they use a business bank account and they maybe a separate business credit card and they just have a bookkeeper and they do all of it really well. Um, and they make their tax payments quarterly or monthly, you know, the federal government. So it's all really well structured and it's easy for them to figure out. Others, you have people who may only pay these taxes, uh, you know, annually in April. So they're not tracking it. And they either worked it out and they have a, have a bill from the IRS that they can cover or not. And it's a little more um, kind of fly by the seat of their pants. So that's where, if you have the opportunity to encourage people to speak to a bookkeeper or an accountant, I mean, I think that's always good 
advice when you're dealing with um, self-employment. And obviously I think people sometimes, you know, they avoid that because of the cost, but even a one-time consultation from a bookkeeper and accountant while they're trying to figure out child support could be really helpful. Um, Cause otherwise it can just be, you know, I've seen people where they didn't track their expenses at all and they had expenses, you know, they were probably nearing 50% of their income, but they just couldn't provide any records. They didn't track it and left the court with very little choice, but to impose a, a child support award that was um, much more than it would have been otherwise. So, it, um, you know, so that's just something to be aware of because we certainly at Division of Child Support is to avoid, I mean, we want people to have right size orders. And I think that's the court's uh, interest as well, right? To have orders that people can actually comply with um, and can, people can stay current on. And so the self-employment piece just adds adds a lot of risk there, a lot of pieces to consider there. Um, there are also a ton of resources for business owners that you could direct people to um, because, you know, a lot of people get into a business, they start a small business and they aren't, they aren't experienced in all these other pieces. They're, you know, they're really good at the, the craft or their vocation. You know, they're really good at fixing computers or they're really good at, um, you know, for, you know, designing, you know, or painting or building furniture, whatever the business is, or even lawyers, right? Anybody. Um, and they have that skill and that's why they're getting into the business. Um, but they don't have any experience with all the other stuff like bookkeeping, um, getting financing and how to create bank accounts and how to do all of that properly. And so there are most counties actually have nonprofits or organizations that help um, provide mentoring and training and guidance um, to people who are starting small businesses. There are also, I listed a few here, there are three kind of that I'm aware of that are at the statewide level that um, have offices and resources and um, meet, they provide meetings and trainings and web-based trainings and actually you can um, call and get assistance. So I definitely encourage um, you to refer people to these areas as well if they're running into issues. There's the Washington Small Business Development Center, which I think is affiliated with the Small Business Administration, so it can help people um, set up their business properly and actually get business financing. There are often grants and other financing and other resources available for business owners that can help avoid, help them get things set up and get on the right path. Business Impact Northwest is another one that um, I've known some people have um, reached out to and they provide some of this training and mentoring and um, help people set up their books and help people manage those, those pieces of the business that always so exciting. And then there's also a state website, business.wa.gov, which is provides small business guidance. It's really great resource for helping people comply with, you know, there's all sorts of licensing requirements um, and other piece, you know, and regulatory requirements and tax filing requirements associated with being in business. So those are some great resources on that, that website as well. Um, so um, before I move on, are there any questions? And again, if anybody has any situations they've run across with small, you know, helping people with self-employment income. I'm happy to address those or take questions back and get some more resources for you. Or if anybody just has any interesting stories they want to share. But it is, um, I know it is a tough area and can be a really um, difficult and kind of disputed area as people are working on these child support issues because there can be a lot of disagreement about um, how much money somebody makes. So Brady, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was working with somebody who had their own business and I got to the income taxes, they straight up said, I don't pay them. Now, mm -hmm. I, I that gets into a whole nother legal issue. But as far as child support purposes, then do you recommend like basically imputing an income tax that they should be paying for those purposes or just leave it as zero because they're not paying it? Yeah, so I assume in that case they weren't they weren't reporting it at all, right? Like they're just, I mean, I think in that case, you know, I think the goal is to get people on the right path. And so the division of child support, we're like, we don't, and the facilitators as well. I know, you know, we don't send people to. We're not the police. We're not sending people. We're not referring them, but encouraging someone to start doing it the right way. Um, kind of once it's, I think, before the court 
and they have tax returns that show no income, but they're honestly trying to report their income for child support purposes. I mean, it's it's kind of at some point the judge, the commissioner is going to um, realize there's an issue there. But I, yeah, I think I I would recommend getting people on the right path, and you can help them or encourage them to seek some of this guidance or tax advice and go actually to the IRS and try and figure out what their income taxes or state taxes would be and then encourage them to file them going forward. I, I think an order that would be based on, you know, child support order based on information that you know, like, you know, where you know someone isn't paying taxes is probably not a good idea, but I'm sure a lot of people just fill it out and kind of enroll with it. But yeah, yeah and Becky, I see has thoughts okay. on it. Yeah, I always have thoughts. Um, my question is, you know, you guys have got forms that you can get off your website where the people can, the opposing parent, because they're not getting cooperation, can ask for the other parent's income information. Right. When you do that, is, what databases are they checking? I mean, is it l &I? Is it IRS? Where, where did they get that information from? Yeah, we have access to um, the state employment security reporting um, and the tax database at the state level. Also, we do have access to the IRS um, databases. Yes. So, so when you're answering that form, what I've noticed is from my perspective as a facilitator, I have more clients that can't get the other parent to cooperate and you have no idea what their income is. Mm -hmm. or they're flat out lying and they're trying to prove it more so than the small business guy who wants to come in and defend himself. I get the other side more often. Yeah. yeah. So I give them the form and say, go find out what you can. Yeah. It, do you have any other tricks of, I don't know if tricks I of mean, trade is what I want. Yeah. But when you cannot get these parents to cooperate and give it up other than that form, any wisdom yeah and usually in that case right there's not even even the information that we go and look at they haven't been disclosing it or uh, so so they haven't been they're just like kaylee's example they haven't been reporting it so even if we pull data from the irs or wherever we don't see it either um i think you know we that's where um you know we can be helpful on the enforcement side right and just right. Once because you get the order once you get the order and so you just kind of you know, the court will do the best that it can um, with and might just or you might just have to impute income or do. Um, but once on the enforcement side, yeah, then that's where we can we have a lot of access to. We have commercial databases that we have access to. We obviously have the employment databases. We can look at we can take bank hits, you know, look at banking records. So we once we're involved on the enforcement side, we have a lot of tools. But yeah, at the front end to get the order that is um well, that is a difficult challenge when you can't figure i mean if you impute them at minimum wage when you know that they're making and at the construction business yeah that's what's frustrating to these folks and you know that you talk to yeah. them fine yeah parent on the other end and you've got facebook shots of, of their business yeah and how productive it is mm -hmm. and that's where uh you know, is we know the all the I mean, you know more than I do, all the issues of around the challenges for people to get legal representation in our system. And that's just that's a whole that's just, different ball game. Yeah. And that's just one of those where like uh, you know, from my private practice days, it's like I mean, that's classic where an attorney could help you. So mm -hmm. you know, but if um, but they're not getting any support, if, so they yeah. have no way to hire the attorney. Yeah, and the the limited imputed income isn't gonna give them much support either. Yeah. So it's a, just a really, really unfortunate, really uh, unfortunate situation. Um, but I think, you know, if you can, you know, I don't, every case is different, but I assume they could do, if they could at least raise the issue with the commissioner, right, or the judge has, when they're in front of them, then hopefully they get a shot at trying to address it. But yeah, there isn't really any magic that we can do, unfortunately, in those cases where someone's really going out of their way. To, so if they know. send that form in, what they're getting is what was reported to L and I under their social. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean we'll look at or whatever resource you know data that we have access to. Yeah, so it's tied to that. 
Um, but that's the so that's exactly the problem you're pointing out. Because that, if they're federal employees and there's nothing reported to state L and I, that's an issue. Oh well, they're um, yeah to L and I or employment security. Um, I don't know about the federal employee piece. I don't, I haven't dealt I've, with that. I've before, seen but... that once or twice. Yeah. We're next to PSNS. Oh, okay. Okay. So when we, we have a great deal of federal employees in Kitsap oh. County and on occasion you get hit and miss. If they're a contractor working on the, at the yard, it's not a problem. The contractor has to report to L and I, but mm. the feds don't report in the same way if they're not paying Washington labors and labor and industries. Yeah, that's a good point. They pay into OWCP, which is yeah. a different database. Yeah. Hmm. I'll check into that. I'll get back to you. I'll find I just haven't run into that, but I'll I'll check into that and see. Or our little sailors. We have a yeah. lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's just an unfortunate situation. But um I'll I'll check into that. That's interesting. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um so the next thing I wanted to touch on, and again, you know, feel free to reach out anytime, you know, we, we're getting moving through, but um, dependency cases, you know, so obviously we don't actually, the Division of Child Support are not super involved in dependency issues, you know, the Division, our counterparts, you know, our sister agency at the Division, uh, Children of, you know, DCYF, Children, Youth, and Families Agency is probably in that, and obviously some of the court agencies are involved in it as well, but I just wanted to highlight a few cases. I hope I hit the mark on this and then we'll talk about what's coming. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of activity in the legislature around dependency. Um, and it's really driven by, I think, a lot of um, advocates and community partners and even work done by DCYF and a lot of you know researchers around um, improving the dependency system and really focusing on the goal of reunification, which leads, based on research, leads to the best the best outcomes or better outcomes for children, the more um, often we can, so the system can focus on reunification, the better outcomes will be, so in general. Um, so obviously back in 2021, a lot of you probably know the legislature authorized um, or directed council representation for youth in dependency cases, and that's been rolled out um, county by kind of county by county um, with full implementation in 2027, and that's managed by the AOC, kind of not the AOC, but the Agency of Office of Civil Legal Aid, OCLA. Um, there's also in 2021 was um, some comprehensive legislation around um, what I mentioned, kind of this parent-child piece and the visitation piece during child welfare proceedings. So historically, visitation had been, you know, limited and that was sometimes used as a form of punishment against parents for not complying with um, you know, some of their their obligations under um, the welfare statutes and the dependency statutes. So it essentially requires regular visitation. You can't use it as a sanction um, and also tries to ensure that, you know, in general, there are visits within 72 hours after the child is, is removed. So again, this focus on keeping that parent-child relationship there, um, keeping that bond in place, um, even if there are a lot of challenges at home that um, warranted the um, the dependency case in the first place. Uh, let's see here. The biggest one, though, I think that most of you are probably familiar with or have heard a lot about or will hear a lot about is um, in 2021 um, regarding the Keeping Families Together Act, it's called. Um, and this addressed a whole range of, of dependency issues, including changes to the standards to remove a child. So it actually um, ensures the some uniformity on this and sets a probable cause standard of harm. Um, it imposes specific requirements in the dependency petitions. Um, also folk directs the state and DCYF to focus on relative placement, which has always been a component, but um, sets it as an even more um, focused goal is to try and place um, children with relatives whenever possible. Um, and then releasing um, a child to the parent during a shelter care hearing to not do so, you know, really a determination of reasonable cause. Also a focus on educational stability. So um, historically, you know, children, um, it's already a very challenging situation, as you know, but there was no or very little focus in systemically to um, keeping kids stable in their education. 
at the school they go to or with um, activities or kind of their social environment. So um, the bill also has some standards around that and tries to encourage that as well. Um, I have some more details here on on some of this, the bigger pieces that I've that I'm aware of the like I mentioned that child removal legal standard is a big piece of that. Um, basically, um, the point of removal is to prevent imminent physical harm. And so there's, you know, we've all read about it, I think, in the news, this idea that kids are removed for nationally, you know, around the country for poverty and other reasons that um, legislature wanted to make clear that it has to be imminent physical harm. Um, also requires the court to, again, make that finding at a shelter care hearing, which happens you know, soon after a child is removed from the home. Um, and again, it provides explicitly provides that certain factors in and of themselves do not equal imminent physical harm, which is poverty or a single parent household or the parent's age or special needs of the parent. Those things had historically been you have been used as the basis for removal and now under this law those factors in and of themselves can't be used so there has to be some other factors some other evidence some other issues related to to those factors before um, a child can be removed he also directs the court to um, really basically a balancing test around the harm caused by the removal versus the threat to safety. So um, really requires the court to take a closer look at, at factors and provide some additional guidance around this, which is what are the conditions of the home and you know, actually weigh that against the harms of, harms of removal. It also rec recognizes the, like I mentioned, that even though situations can be difficult at home, making sure that um, it rises to the level of the, the necessary harm before a child's removed. Also emphasizes that relative placement, courts have to prioritize replace, um, placement with relatives and other suitable persons, which could be a close, close family friend or some, you know, where there's some sort of relationship typically. Um, and then it imposes specific obligations on DCYF to place children with relatives and other suitable. So um, really, um, really trying to make sure that agencies and those involved in dependency are focused on these, these pieces. Um, and as you know, on the child support side, though, some interesting things have happened as well. You have, so historically, I think a lot of you know that um, foster care cases, and you probably read about this in the news, I heard about it in news and NPR this um, last few months, is the idea that if someone, if you're, there's a foster care case, um, historically, DCS would then pursue collection from the parents to actually reimburse the state for costs of the foster care. Um, and some recent studies and efforts by advocates and even our federal Office of Child Support Enforcement Office or you know, OCSE issued new guidance essentially saying that that is not a good idea. And actually when we look at the numbers and we've looked at them for our state as well, um, it's not cost effective to go after a foster care, um, you know, the biological parent and their child's in foster care um, for, um, for those costs. It's just, we spend a um, greater amount of money trying to recoup those funds than we actually receive for the state. It also is a huge burden and impede, um, you know, for the goal of reunification. So you have all these obligations are pace, placed on these biological parents to either get, get well, get um, services, drug treatment, whatever it may be. And then here comes the state imposing a financial obligation on them. And that's just created, um, a lot of challenges. So now the direction we're moving and DCYF is moving is um, to actually make um, essentially a finding of good cause in these cases and limit, except in cases of extreme cases, like cases of abandonment, um, where we will no longer enforce child support um, on these um, biological parents while there's a dependency action. So as a result, we um, closed all of nearly all of our foster care child support enforcement cases. Um, which is a big, big change. And I think the advocates and people in your legal community you know, continue, you'll probably hear more and more about this as well. So it's a very interesting and very um, significant change. And then um, kinship care, which of course relate, you know, family care, which relates to dependency cases, there's um, growing interest around this as well. And this is where you might run into the situation where, you know, the grandparent is taking care of a child, um, you know, their, their grandchild, and they're trying to figure out what resources they can ask, access. So historically, it's a similar problem. So they might ask for um, TANF, 
assistance, and that would result in a child support order placed upon their might be their biological the biological parent who might be their their own child. So they don't want to create those increased burdens for their own children as they're trying to um, work through the process to reunify with their with their the grandchildren or their children. So um, there's a lot of interest on this piece as well. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more about this and hear more about this. Um, DSHS recently has made it easier for care for people in this situation to apply for what's called good cause so that they can, um, which essentially when there's good cause, then DCS does not go after the, the parent in that example for, for funds. So um, this I think is a extension or related to the issue I mentioned on foster care. Um, collection. So I, I expect to see more changes in this, this area as well. Um, with that, that's kind of my highlight on dependency cases. Like I said, there's a lot, lot going on and I'm sure um, there are attorneys, um, you know, in each of your counties or, you know, legal aid attorneys and others involved in it. Um, but if, if you ever have any questions, um, you can either ask them now or you can always reach out to me and I can connect you with, um, with the right resources or, um, that we have here at the Division of Child Support. So are there any other questions or things I can address? I have a question. This is Diana, I'm in Island County. So yeah. I know they're not uh, dependency cases, but um, a lot of our um, emergency minor guardianship cases mm -hmm. are being filed um, in lieu of dependency cases. Yeah. Um, social workers are um, encouraging strongly um, grandparents or family relatives to file emergency minor guardianship cases to keep the out of the dependency mm -hmm. um, world. So in those types of situations, are those, um, those good cause, um, is that something that's available to parent, grandparents or such? Um, Oh. It's not a dependency, right? But is that something that's available for uh, the, you know, emergency minor guardianship cases? Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'll check with my counterpart at the um, at the community services division that where they actually administer those benefits, and I'll check get some specific info that I can share with you on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, we're almost to the end of the hour. That went fast. I'm sorry I rambled so much, but I hope uh, we've gave you a glimpse into what's going on. And like I said, um, here's my um, cell phone and email. Um, I have the good fortune of working with several attorneys with lots, lots of experience, many, many years of experience. And so um, anything that I can't answer, I'm always happy to be a connector and um, can chase down information for... Um, for any of you at any time, whether it's a legislative question that um, just in general you're trying to get an answer to um, or some other information, I'm always happy to be helpful there. So, Great. Thank you so much, Brady, for your time. Um, and if more topics come up too as a whole, we'll be reaching back out to maybe do another training with you as well. Yeah. Um, so good. thank you so much. That was wonderful. Lots to learn. Um, I'm yeah. going to go ahead and stop the